Hello everybody, welcome back. Music Corner, as always, host, uh, T.Y. Hilton, wide receiver for the Indianapolis Colts, and today it is time to talk recap, the second video recap. This time we are covering the months of September and October of 2020. A lot of big popular records from popular artists, highly anticipated albums came out over the past two months. Not a whole lot of them were great. That's what I'll say. Normally these videos are split into a popular reviews, bad reviews, good reviews, section, but today I think I'm just going to combine the popular and bad and work from the records that I enjoyed all the way down to some of the really, really disappointing ones because there were a whole lot of records that I was anticipating being really great over the last two months. Didn't turn out that way for many of them, and at the very end I'll rattle off a couple of my favorite records that have come out over the last two months. Without any further delay, let's jump right in to the best and least disappointing records I heard from big popular artists. Starting with just a few days ago, we heard the new album, the third album in the last three years from pop songstress Ariana Grande, Positions. It's only been out for a few days, but I enjoy it. I think it's pretty good. I don't think it's necessarily as good as Sweetener or Thank You Next, but I liked a lot of the songs on here. It had some great highlights, and in general, I think it's one of the better pop records you're going to hear this year. Following that up from the realm of Screamo, Touche Amore with Lament. Now, this band's last record, Stage 4, was mind-blowing, incredibly uh, depressing, but this is a little bit less intense. Maybe that's not the right way to describe a Screamo record, but the emotions on display here aren't quite as disparaging as on the last record, and it's good. For the most part, there are some weird ideas and mixes on tracks here that don't work super well, but for the most part, like I said, the band is sticking to what they do well and making good Screamo-flavored post-hardcore music. Next on the ballot, we've got a uh, hyper pop genre and gender bender Dorian Electra with My Agenda, a absolute hurricane of a hyper pop record with some insane features, some crazy ideas. Uh, there are tracks on this thing that will confuse you. There are tracks on this thing that will absolutely blow you away with how cool and crazy and original they are. There's a lot going on on this album, but I think it's really good. We've also got another pretty good record from YG, My Life 400. YG's last couple of albums didn't really live up to the amazing standard that he set on Still Brazy. Yeah. But this record at least had signs of what once made him one of my most uh, anticipated upcoming artists in the hip hop scene. There are some great throwback West Coast bangers on here. And the only problem I have with the record is the tracks that try to go for this really muddled contemporary trap flair and don't work very well, but it's mostly great tracks with a handful of songs that kind of drag it down. Next up, a pair of indie albums I already anticipate being slandered for not loving. Starting with Sufjan Stevens, The Ascension, this big, long, 80-minute conglomeration of Sufjan music, and yes, there are some incredible, amazing songs in the mix here. There's some great long tracks, but there are also some incredibly tedious and arduous wastes of time on this record. There is no need for this thing to be 80 minutes in length. Come on. Even the most diehard Sufjan fans have to admit that some of this stuff is just not as good. And on the other side of that coin, Future Islands with their new record. Now, I love Future Islands. Future Islands always releases great singles. There's a great single, like a great single from this record too, but like most of their albums, it's just incredibly one note. The tracks that hit the hardest are great and you return to them and there's pretty much no reason to listen to anything else. Uh, even though this isn't the longest record in the world, it can feel like it sometimes. One of my most anticipated hip-hop albums of the entire year was the second collaboration from 21 Savage and Metro Boomin' Savage Mode 2. Not because I loved the original, I thought it was okay, but because both of these guys have grown a lot as artists since then, particularly 21 Savage since his last record, and almost every time he's shown up on a feature since, including the Metro Boomin' album, he's absolutely killed it. So I thought these guys were going to absolutely hit it out of the park, but as it turns out, 
they are not really delivering highlights on this thing, aside from the incredible track Steppin', which sticks out like a sore thumb amongst the rest of the moody trap-flavored songs on this track list. This is not the variety and experimentation that I was anticipating from these guys. They're sort of laying back and acting like what they're doing is really grand and really expansive, but they're just kind of making decent trap tunes. It's a decent record. There's a, there's a lot of good songs on here, good fundamentals from these two, but it absolutely does not take that extra step that I was really hoping it would. Next up is Melanie Martinez with her After School EP. Uh, I liked K-12 through a lot last year. I thought that record was really good. And this is clearly just B-sides and leftovers and songs that didn't make the cut. While there are a few great tracks on here, it's clear why some of these songs were not up to snuff with tracks from K-12. through And another record I was really highly anticipating, the Open Mic Eagle album anime trauma and divorce i've been a big fan of mics for long a long time i've dished out a lot of end of the year praise towards mike this is not his best work in my opinion there are some hooks on here that don't hit like they normally do there are some really really just mellow and uninspired beats on this record that also doesn't feel like something Mike normally does. And his talent for songwriting and storytelling and vocal delivery shines through and carries a lot of this record, but it doesn't have all the bells and whistles that have made some of his other projects so, so good. Similarly, Idols with Ultra Mono. Now, I love Idols. I really enjoyed the first two Idols records, and I was looking forward to this record. There was no reason why I thought I wasn't going to like it, even though a couple of the singles didn't really hit me as hard as I was hoping for. But the result of this thing is just a little bit corny, a little bit tacky, not the really genuine fist-pumping punk rock that the band dropped on their first two records. It's not as intricate, it's not as interesting, the politically charged moments don't hit me in the same way, and I'm just kind of left feeling like this is just okay, like it's an okay record. If I listen to this out of context, I would never say that, oh wow, this is Idol's caliber of songwriting. I definitely think it's their weakest yet. Of course, uh, AJ Cook of PC Music fame, of Hyperpop fame, he dropped that behemoth of an almost three hour project, 7G, that I talked about in the last recap and even mentioned that this record was coming out. And I actually prefer 7G a lot compared to this, which I was hoping would be a more personal and proper debut album from AJ Cook. And in some aspects it is, but this thing is cluttered with weird songs, with conflicting priorities, and almost no personality. Like, I know that if you heard a lot of these songs, you would recognize A.G. Cook's instrumentals, but there's a whole lot here that screams A.G. Cook, the person, the artist, the songwriter, and the result is just a little bit disappointing. And I would never have thought that I would end up returning to 7G a lot more than what would become his proper studio debut album. I was similarly underwhelmed with Katy Perry's Smile. If you know, or if you watched my uh, video about songs from 2010, you'll know I'm a huge fan of Katy Perry's Teenage Dream. Love that record, fantastic record. Since then, mostly misses, and Smile isn't really recovering from that. Um, yes, there's a couple pretty good tracks, a couple great singles from this album, but for the most part, it is just sounding less inspired than ever before, more generic than ever before. There were songs from this thing repping Target commercials before the album even came out, and that's a pretty good metaphor for what the record ultimately sounds like, which is just kind of generic boilerplate pop music. Deftones. Ohms. Um, another record I was really excited for, Love Deftones, in their heyday, one of the best new metal and alternative metal bands. And Ohms flashes that ferocious intensity at points and then goes on some kind of long lull moments of just drab, kind of dreary songs, kind of melodramatic songs that seem underneath Deftones and their potential and the caliber of their songwriting and just kind of confused me as to how they made it onto this record in the first place. 
And speaking of inconsistencies, there is no record I've heard this year that is as inconsistent as the new Blackpink album, The Album. This is one of the only contemporary K-pop groups that has really, really excited me in the past. So I was anticipating this record, I was really excited about this record, and for good reason, because of the eight songs here, three or four of them are absolutely fantastic, riveting, confident, Bangers. It's just that the other half of this record is muddling, miserable, underwhelming pop fused with sometimes electronica, sometimes hip-hop, and it doesn't work at all. So if you're giving this record a listen, I think you'll find right out of the gate that there are some absolutely amazing songs and some of the worst pop tracks I've heard all year. I didn't really know what to make of this thing. It was a tough review to write, but... I certainly know there are a couple songs that I will never ever want to return to again. Now I know this is the disappointing section, but I do want to put the new 6 9 record, Tattletales, here. Not because I was disappointed with it, but because it was exactly what I expected, to be honest. Even though there were a couple tracks here, the opener with Akon and the Jail Phone song that I thought were refreshing and kind of fun. I did enjoy songs from this thing like Gooba. I enjoyed the track with Nicki Minaj quite a bit. Uh, but it's just what you expect. It's 6 9 A lot of the songs are pretty one note. The lyrics can be kind of stupid. The features on here, for the most part, are terrible. Like a couple of the features on this record totally ruin otherwise pretty good songs. And the result is just a mixed bag, like all the 6 9 records. The album that I would say truly disappointed me the most over the last two months has got to be the new neighborhood record, Chip Chrome and the Monotones. Now I really enjoyed the last neighborhood record, the self-titled one, the original track list that was just the first release of the self-titled one without all the extra EP and bonus stuff. I thought this was really good. I was excited for Chip Chrome and the Monotones. I thought a couple of the singles were all right, but this is just so vapid. There's just nothing. It's so short. There's interludes and short tracks with absolutely nothing to them. It's just airy and there's not a whole lot to grab onto. And when you actually do get a tangible, structured, functioning song on this record, there's like a 50-50 chance that it's either average material by the band standards or just bland pap nonsense. So it's safe to say I was pretty let down by this wanted it to be a lot better, looking forward for what The Neighborhood does next, although given the Jesse Solo album as well as this, I will be going into it cautiously. And finally, uh, Marilyn Manson with We Are Chaos. Wasn't head over heels for this album, did not love this album, even though there are some late Manson albums, or specifically some songs on later Manson albums that I think are really great, and I think are the watermark of late stage career songwriting. But this time around, we don't get any of that. I just want to wonder where the energy has gone. Like a lot of these kind of tacky, kind of bland indie rock songs pop up on here and it doesn't feel like the ferocity and the intensity that we are used to from Marilyn Manson that we expect from Marilyn Manson, unfortunately. As far as my favorite and the best things I heard over the last two months, it was pretty slim. I got four albums and an EP, although one of those albums, the first one we're gonna crack open today, is quite a doozy. The Matmos record, The Consuming Flame, open exercises in group form. This thing is a monster, three hour long, three full disc project from Matmos. There is a lot going on here. A really intricate list of collaborators. This was a huge project from the band. In most artists, I wouldn't even take something like this seriously, but given the caliber of what Matmos has released over their career, I went into this thing hesitant but excited for what it had to offer and found that it was really good. There is a ton, a ton of great material on this record. And well, obviously not everything is perfect. There is so much great stuff here, so much great variety of stuff here. If experimental, 
electronic abstract music is your bag you probably already are pretty familiar with matmos and if you chose not to listen to this record i actually highly recommend it i know it's long but i guarantee you you will find a number of tracks particularly on the amazing third disc that are really worth your time Next up, a highly anticipated record that did end up living up to the hype for the most part, Fleet Foxes with Shore. Now I know this is not Crack Up, and for me Crack Up was the best Fleet Foxes record because of those winding compositions, those really intricate sound palettes. This is much more like the debut Fleet Foxes record in terms of simple, to the point, catchy, indie folk flavored songwriting but they do it really well. There's a lot of good songs on here. If you've liked any Fleet Foxes in the past, you're definitely gonna like this thing. Indie music in general, this record is very beautiful, very poetic from Robert Pegnold, as always. It's pretty much what you expect from Fleet Foxes, but they delivered on it, and they're really four for four on albums up to this point, even if not all of them are, to me, as great as most people say they are. Getting even better, I was really excited to dive into the Gorillaz Song Machine Volume 1 Strange Times project because single after single after single really excited me and getting the full track list here, at least the standard edition full track list, was great. For the most part, a lot of these singles hold up really well and there are some great deep cuts here that support them. Now, I'll warn you that if you're listening to this thing on Spotify or Apple Music, you're getting the deluxe edition and the deluxe edition songs are not nearly as good as the core of the record. But that being said, there's still some gems in there that are worth listening to and the core 11 or 12 tracks, how many of it is on this record, is exciting, engaging, the guest features are wonderful time and time again, and it's just some of the best music I've heard from Gorillaz in a decade, literally since Plastic Beach. Now the only full length album over the last two months that really just absolutely blew me away, knocked my socks off, and immediately became one of my favorite records of the year was the new clipping project visions of bodies being burned. Now this is the sequel to last year's clipping project which I called my 10th favorite record of the year and this thing is even better and will be even higher on my list. The consistency here is fantastic. The band is delivering one either fiery, intense, horror-themed banger after another, or at other points on this record, they are stripping it back, taking it more low-key in the delivery and horrifying you with intricate lyricism and storytelling, the blasted-out industrial instrumentation, the heavy, boombastic hip-hop beats. Everything about this record is just pieced together by like mad scientists who are building and just a monster that just pummels you into submission in the most like ethereal and horrifying and pleasurable way possible. It's very hard to explain in words what makes this such a whirlwind compelling sonic experience but just dive into it and give it a listen. Prepare yourself to be uh, beaten up by this record is what I'll tell you and that's exactly what it's gonna do. And finally, it should be no surprise to anyone who's been following me for any amount of time that I adored the new James Blake EP before. Just four tracks from James this time, and it doesn't include either of the two great singles we heard from him earlier this year, excuse me. And these four tracks are wonderful. They're great. I love all of them. It's a near perfect record. I have very little problems with this album. Once again, James is indulging in the details, the intimate textures of these instrumentals and of his vocal manipulations in crafting these absolutely beautiful, layered, imaginative fusions of R&B and electronica that have made him one of the best artists of the last decade. His sound is consistently evolving and even with the poppier direction that Assume Form went in, he's back to a little bit more abstract and experimental electronica on this one. And just like everything he's touched so far, he once again kills it. These songs are amazing. This EP is amazing. I highly recommend it. And that's pretty much that. That's, that's the recap. Two months. It's not every album I reviewed, but it should be most of the highlights 
Uh, if you came here to get at me over the uh, Flaming Lips review, I know, I know, it, it's too low of score. It's a little bit better album than I gave it credit for. It is absolutely not one of the best albums of the year, one of the best Flaming Lips albums ever. I think this thing is maybe like a five and a half at its highest. I'm going to continue to indulge with it because so many people say it's so good, uh, even though, God, the lyricism is so corny, it's so hard to sit through. But we'll see if it's grown on me a little bit by the end of the year. And that's not important, though. That's all the records I had to talk about. As always, thank you for watching. Go Colts. Uh, I hope they beat whatever team you cheer for. And when they do or don't, you can get at me over that. And uh, aside from that, see you next time. Uh, you know me. I don't know what I'm going to be doing next time. But I bet it will be yellow.